Why do so many Jews support gun control? Part of God's law, as given in the Torah, is that we have a right to defend ourselves. Have they forgotten their past? We need to prepare to defend ourselves and defend our lives against those who would hurt us. Why do so many Jews favor disarming law-abiding citizens? We have an obligation to defend ourselves. We have a right to defend our property. Has never again become meaningless. It's in fact considered to be the most unnatural idea that you would try to take that right away from someone. Self-preservation is a God-given right as described in the Torah. Contrary to God's law, many Jewish politicians and influential Jewish leaders promote gun control measures that take away that right. They believe in man's law, the same laws that have denied Jews the ability to arm and defend themselves and their property for thousands of years. The same laws that make it illegal for Jews to follow the commandments in Torah law that obligates Jews to defend themselves. Historically, the Jewish people have been denied the option of self-defense. Really, it's, it's in America today, it's in Western civilization today that we have the possibility of arming and protecting ourselves. The last time Jews were allowed to own any kind of defensive weaponry was during the time of Bavel, the authors of the Babylonian Talmud. During that period, Jews were allowed to be armed. But from then until today, Jews by and large have been disarmed. And so we have not been prepared to defend ourselves. We are not used to this way of thinking. We are very much used to being the victim. Nineteen twenty eight, pre Nazi Germany. Street violence breaks out due to political and economic uncertainty. Well intended citizens with seemingly good intentions, like the seemingly good intentions of Jewish gun control advocates today, passed the nineteen twenty eight Firearms and Ammunition Control Act which required all gun owners to register their firearms. The foundation for disaster was laid. Little did they know or foresee the consequences. Nineteen thirty-three, Hitler is elected to power. He uses the registered names of firearm owners to his advantage. While loyal party members were excluded, all law-abiding gun owners were put on a list, the same kind of list gun control promoters want in America today. Gun owners were then slowly and systematically disarmed. 1938, Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. The Nazis know exactly how many Jews have firearms. They know exactly how little resistance they will encounter. On the 9th of November, the coordinated attack begins. Ninety-one Jews are murdered. Twenty-five to thirty-five thousand are arrested and placed in concentration camps. One day later, an amendment prohibiting Jews from possessing weapons is passed. Juden ist der Erwerb, der Besitz und das Führen von Schusswaffen und Munition. Jews are prohibited from acquiring, possessing and carrying firearms and ammunition. Waffen und Munition, die sich im Besitz eines Firearms and ammunition found in a Jew's possession will be forfeited to the government without compensation. Wer den Vorschriften des Paragraphen 1 vorsetzt, whoever willfully or negligently violates the provision will be punished with imprisonment and a fine. This is man's law at work. This is man's law creating situations where people are vulnerable. When the right to self-defense is denied, 
God's law is violated. Would history have been rewritten if the SS confronted thousands of armed Jews during the riots of Kristallnacht? I'm not going to say that things would have been different if they had been armed. I don't know how things would have been. But I am going to say that if they had been armed, they had a chance. Nineteen forty, four hundred thousand unarmed Polish Jews are herded into the Warsaw Ghetto, awaiting deportation to Nazi extermination camps. Nineteen forty-three, a few hundred Jewish resistance fighters, armed with smuggled-in pistols and rifles, succeed in stopping the well-trained and heavily equipped Nazi forces for a month. Facing a machine gun, there isn't much that a group of unarmed civilians can possibly do. I don't know what would have been different, and I'm certainly not going to stand here and say the Holocaust wouldn't have happened. I don't know. But I do know that if Jews had not turned in their firearms, if Jews had not registered their guns on Hitler's registry, things would have been different. Could they perhaps have better protected and defended themselves? Leading up to the war for Israeli independence, laws were enacted to prohibit the sale of firearms to Jews under the British mandate for Palestine. An arms embargo was imposed, weapons were confiscated, and Jews, if found with a gun, were arrested and jailed. Once again, seemingly good-intended gun control legislation was enacted as a means to defuse tension among the Arabs. In exchange, the British promised the Jewish people protection. This is very much a reoccurring story. No, the British did not protect the Jewish people, and when the Arab muftis would incite crowds to riot against the Jewish people, uh, the British did very little to stop that. To defend themselves, the Zionists built secret ammunition factories and kibbutzes. They illegally purchased and hid World War II issued Nazi Mauser rifles. The swastika was filed off and replaced with the Star of David. Ironically, these weapons later proved decisive in the 1948 War for Independence. It's ironic, isn't it? We Jews, we sit in America, and most of us don't own guns. Most of us think guns are somehow non-Jewish in some strange way. And yet, we're very proud to see an Israeli soldier carrying an Uzi, an M16, whatever it is, flying a fighter plane. That makes us proud. And yet, in some strange way, it's not for us. These things don't happen here. Terrorism against Jews is not an ocean apart, and Jewish oppression is not a chapter in the history books. It's alive and well today. Stop and think here for a minute in this room where we're standing. If an active shooter walked into this room right now, what would happen? Would any of us know what to do? Would any of us have anything at all that we could do about it? August 10th, 1999. Inside the area, there still might be something going on and they're uh, not taking any chances. Buford Furrow walks into the lobby of the North Valley Jewish Community Center in Granada Hills and unloads 70 shots into the complex. Five people are wounded, three children, a teenaged counselor, and an office worker. 
June 10, 2009, 88-year-old white supremacist James Von Braun enters the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. and guns down a security guard. October 29, 2009, a lone teenager opens fire in a Los Angeles synagogue parking lot. Two men are wounded as they entered the synagogue for morning prayers. We felt it was important to come together uh, today, uh, not just as Jewish members, but as members of Congress who represent districts across the United States of America. Now, the Jewish reaction to a lot of this, quite frankly, the knee-jerk liberal reaction to a lot of this, which I hope will cease to be synonymous with the Jewish reaction. We've seen gunmen go into daycare centers and shoot children. This is not just an issue directed at uh, American Jews. Is that we can prevent these sorts of things with what is commonly known as gun control. We can take guns off the streets and these things will stop happening. This simply cannot happen and cannot continue to happen. Gun control laws in California and Washington, D.C. are some of the most stringent in the nation. As an ex-convict, it was illegal for Buford Furrow to own a firearm. Yet, when he arrived at the Jewish Community Center, he had five rifles in his possession. As a convicted felon, it was illegal for James Von Brunn to own a firearm. Yet, when he entered the Holocaust Museum, he openly carried a rifle. Gun control laws only affect law-abiding citizens. Gun control laws only aid criminals by keeping self-defense weaponry out of the hands of their intended victims. It is my opinion that every Jew, and I mean every Jew, should know how to shoot a gun. And Jews who are physically and psychologically fit to do so should own guns, should train in using them properly for defensive purposes, and under appropriate circumstances should even be carrying them. In an effort to educate people, Rabbi Bendori regularly conducts classes on firearm safety and proper use. This is why you always treat the gun as if it's loaded, period. The goal, to understand and respect firearms for what they are, a tool for defensive purposes. In my experience, most Jews associate guns with violence simply because we have no experience with guns as Jews in this country and our historical memory of guns is being at the wrong end of the barrel. Many Jews see themselves as victims. They see the world as a scary and threatening place in which they are helpless. According to psychiatrist Sarah Thompson, the reason for this behavior is an instinctive defensive mechanism called projection. Defense mechanisms psychologically protect people from feelings they cannot consciously accept the fear of hate crimes, bigotry, or the Holocaust. These intolerable feelings are then projected onto an inanimate object, such as a gun, so the projector believes the gun itself commits a crime. Victimization also gives a group identity. By claiming victim status, members of a group receive special treatment. They believe there's no alternative but to remain a victim forever. Therefore, they must count on the group to speak on their behalf and protect them. Groups like the Anti-Defamation League, the Southern Poverty Law Center, the Violence Policy Center, or the Million Mom March rely on their membership's victim status. It's not in their best interest to promote self-defense, even though the research clearly demonstrates firearm ownership is the most effective way to protect law-abiding citizens and their families. Many of these groups promote the popular belief less guns means less violence. To some, this assumption seems to make sense, but the evidence proves just the opposite. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, every day 550 rapes and 1,100 murders are prevented just by the intended victim showing a gun. That's over 600,000 people each year that stop a serious crime before it happens without ever firing a shot. In a firearm study of polled felons, 
The U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics also found that 57% of felons agree criminals are more worried about meeting an armed victim than they are about running into the police. If self-defensive weapons are banned, how will citizens protect themselves? Are the police equipped to protect citizens at a moment's notice? The average response time to a 911 call is 10 minutes or more. Every perpetrator knows this and plans their attacks accordingly. Can the police actually adjust their priorities to provide added security during Jewish holidays? Even the Supreme Court has ruled that state and local governments do not have an obligation to protect citizens from criminal harm. So, can the police really protect us? In London, where handguns have been banned since 1997, the London Evening Standard reports that two years following the ban, handgun crimes rose by 40%. Violent crime in the United Kingdom has increased 44 percent, from 618,000 in 1998 to more than 879,000 crimes in March 2010. The British government and police once again claimed they could protect the people. The Australian gun ban of 1997 confirms similar results. While armed assault rates and armed murder rates remain the same, Robbery and armed robbery actually rose from 1997 through 2002, then leveled off to the same rates as before the gun ban. A study recently published by the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy finds nations with stringent anti-gun laws have higher murder rates than those that do not. In Western Europe, Norway has one of the highest rates of gun ownership. It also has the lowest murder rate. In contrast, Luxembourg has one of the highest murder rates, but handguns are banned. In Russia, where private firearms were banned under communist rule, the study shows the murder rate is four times higher than in the US and 20 times higher than Norway. So how can this be? If the belief that less guns means less violence is true, then murder rates should decline. The data proves it doesn't. Many anti-gun advocates are quick to point out that nations that have banned firearms have fewer murders by handguns. They dismiss the fact that the overall murder rate remains consistent. They dismiss the fact that it is the human being, not the weapon, that commits murder. Currently, the United Nations is drafting an arms trade treaty to impose strict worldwide controls on firearms. They publicize armed violence takes the lives of 740,000 people each year. This is an exaggerated claim which they use to influence policymakers. Of that 740,000 number, they allege 490,000 are non-war-related homicides and 250,000 deaths are directly or indirectly due to war. According to a recent study, those alleged figures are too high and are out of line with other research. The UN claims the figures are based on global homicide rates and statistical models they refuse to publish. Until thoroughly documented data is made public, the UN's claim is unsubstantiated. The Arms Trade Treaty demands worldwide gun registration and the destruction of all small arms. The treaty is backed and funded by IANSA, the International Action Network on Small Arms. IANSA is an international non-governmental organization that is financially supported by 120 countries, including Great Britain, Brazil, Canada and Japan. IANSA played a significant role in the Australian gun ban legislation in 1997. The group has publicly stated they oppose the use of firearms for self-defense. IANSA is at war with Jewish law. Sadly, the organization is largely funded by billionaire hedge fund manager and Holocaust survivor George Soros. From 1979 to 2007, 
Soros' foundation, the Open Society Institute, has donated billions of dollars to promote his anti-American, radical leftist worldview agenda. They support the election of political candidates who share their view. They subscribe to the notion of bringing American foreign policy under the control of the United Nations. And they have funneled tens of millions of dollars annually to gun control organizations in worldwide support of stricter gun control measures. Should IANSA and the UN succeed with their global gun control agenda, a non-elected body of bureaucrats would take the issue of gun control out of the hands of the U.S. electorate and undermine the Constitution. What's at stake is the Second Amendment. The language of the Second Amendment to the Bill of Rights is straightforward and very clear. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. This right to keep and bear arms is not something given to us by our government. It's a pre-existing right, as in a God-given right. And in fact, we find this right in the Torah. The framers of the Constitution believed in God. They fought for the freedom from religious persecution. They firmly believe the right to self-defense is a fundamental God-given right. And the government's role is to protect that right. In terms of supporting Second Amendment, we should be supporting elected officials who advocate gun rights. We should be advocating gun rights ourselves. And we should advocate for the repeal of the sorts of gun control measures that we have seen throughout the world and throughout history have severe consequences to the people that were subject to those restrictions. Laws that protect rights must be fought for and preserved. No one would deny preserving the right to free speech or freedom of religious expression. And yet, many are willing to give up the protector of those rights, the Second Amendment. They are willing to give up the right of personal defense in exchange for security by someone who promises protection. I specifically looked into this issue of personal defense. What are my Torah obligations? And what does the Torah have to say about firearms ownership, about gun ownership, about being prepared for such situations? And what I found was that Torah law is very, very clear, that God has an expectation that we will defend ourselves. We're required to do so by Torah law, and we are required to be prepared to defend ourselves against reasonable threats. In Rambam, Laws of Robbery, chapter 9, paragraph 7 says, One who breaks into a home, whether by day or night, if the homeowner or anyone else kills him, there is no crime. In fact, permission is given to anyone to intervene and kill the invader by any means necessary. So according to Maimonides, criminal trespass on your front lawn is already enough to justify the use of force to get this person off of your property. You need not wait until the person is inside of the home. In Leviticus 19, verse 16, it is written, Do not stand idly by your brother's blood. Rashi says, do not stand idly by the blood of your neighbor. For example, if you see him dying and you can help, you are forbidden from standing by and doing nothing. In Jewish law, we have very few rights. We have obligations. One of our obligations in Jewish law is to defend and protect and save and rescue the innocent. Lo ta'amor adam recha. If you see another person in trouble and you can help, you are required to help. Contrary to the opinion of some Jews and Christians alike, the interpretation of the Sixth Commandment, Thou shalt not kill, does not forbid the use of deadly force for defensive purposes. The original Hebrew translation of the Sixth Commandment is as follows, Thou shalt not murder. 
the two words kill and murder have dramatically contrasting meanings. There are certain areas that are strikingly different between Jewish law and secular law or between God's law and man's law. So for example, where I live in New Jersey, if there is someone inside of my home, I'm allowed to use a gun against that person. If there's someone inside my neighbor's home and I went with my gun to protect my neighbor's home, I would be arrested and put on trial for that. In Jewish law, I have an obligation to help. And if I can help, but I don't, I am held culpable by God himself. He holds me responsible. I answer to a higher authority. We as Jews have a choice. We can live by God's law or we can die by man's law. In regard to self-defense, many supposedly prominent Jewish politicians and civic leaders have chosen to oppose God's law in favor of man's law. I think the first thing that we have to do is recognize where this gun control is coming from. We need to recognize the laws that are a problem and we need to identify the people that are behind them. California Senator Dianne Feinstein opposes God's law. In a 60-minute interview on the topic of gun control, she said this, If I could have gotten 51 votes in the Senate of the United States for an outright ban, picking up every one of them, Mr. and Mrs. America, turn them all in, I would have done it. Her statement contradicts her own actions, as she once had a concealed weapons permit to carry a handgun in California. New Jersey Senator Frank Lautenberg opposes God's law. He and Senator Feinstein voted in favor of firearms confiscation during national disasters, such as Hurricane Katrina, a time when self-defense is most needed from criminals and roving gangs of looters. In 2007, Senator Lautenberg voted against the Vitter Amendment, a bill that protects U.S. citizens from gun registration laws imposed by international groups or agencies, including the United Nations. Rabbi Eric Yaffe of the Union for Reform Judaism opposes God's law. At a Million Mom March rally, he stated, controlling guns is not only a political matter, it is a solemn religious obligation. But he provides no Jewish sources to back up his assertion. Child Holocaust survivor and national director of the Anti-Defamation League, Abraham Foxman, opposes God's law. Given the evidence of his own disarmed people suffering at the hands of the Nazis, his support for gun control contradicts the Torah tradition he claims to honor. The ADL, which monitors and tracks anti-Semitic activity around the world, favors a disarmed populace. The ADL fought in support of Washington, D.C.'s ban on the possession of firearms in the landmark 2008 Supreme Court decision, District of Columbia v. Heller, and the 2010 follow-up ruling in McDonald v. the City of Chicago. In those cases, the court upheld that the Second Amendment guarantees the individual right to keep and bear arms, and that right extends fully to state and local laws. The ADL argued against it. Contrary to Torah law, the ADL contends that states should retain the right to keep guns out of the hands of its citizens. Amazingly, the ADL supports a U.S. gun control law that was rooted in Nazi law, the Gun Control Act of 1968. This federal law was authored by Senator Thomas Dodd of Connecticut and signed by President Johnson. Like the 1938 Nazi Weapons Act, the U.S. Gun Control Act of 1968 dictated who could and who could not own a firearm and put restrictions on the types of guns Americans can own. Prior to writing the bill, on July 2, 1968, Senator Dodd requested a translation of the 1938 Nazi weapons law from the Library of Congress. 
A comparison of the language in the final bill shows some of it was copied word for word from the same laws the Nazis used in 1938. The same laws that put Europeans on a list 30 years earlier were now being used to put Americans on a list. The same laws that were approved by Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party. The staunch anti-gun senator from New York, Charles Schumer, also opposes God's law. He has sponsored many bills to ban military appearing weapons and to impose a waiting period on handgun sales. Although Mr. Schumer is opposed to his constituents owning firearms, he himself enjoys pheasant hunting with his colleague in the House, Ben Nelson of Nebraska. California Congressman Henry Waxman opposes God's law. He absurdly made this statement in 2008. If someone is so fearful that they are going to start using their weapons to protect their rights, it makes me very nervous that these people have weapons at all. In contrast to Mr. Waxman's statement, the great liberal Jewish Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis wrote, we shall have lost something vital and beyond price on the day when the state denies us the right to resort to force. It is evident. The rights and liberties afforded to Americans through the Constitution are under attack by reckless politicians and misguided leaders. Why would Mr. Waxman be nervous about people protecting their rights, unless he was trying to take away those rights? Is he embracing God's laws or man's laws? Let me give you an example of how absurd some of man's laws are. I live in New Jersey, so here is my New Jersey firearms identification card. My New Jersey firearms identification card, I have to show any time I want to even hold a gun in a store or buy any ammunition. Now, this has my name on it, my address, all sorts of interesting things, and my fingerprint. I don't get fingerprinted when I go to buy something, and no one exactly checks this for identification before selling me ammunition. What's the purpose of this? The purpose of this is to have my name on a list so that the state police know that I'm a gun owner. There's no other reason to do this. Why do they need to have such a list? This is the kind of gun control, this is the kind of man's law that begins to cause the trouble that we're talking about. What seems impossible replays itself over and over again. Those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Never again means vigilance. Is our generation keeping watch? Americans have to decide. They can repeat the past or work to eliminate those laws that destroy our rights. Well, we have a principle in Jewish law. The principle is Dina de Machut Dina, which essentially means that you follow the law of the land. Now, following the law of the land has its limits. You don't follow the law of the land if it forces you to violate Torah law. So when you start talking about things like gun control here in the States, Torah law does not say, go out and break the law. What it says is, that's an unjust law, Go out and do everything you can to change it. The time for change is now. Americans can no longer be complacent. Political and economic uncertainty is once again on the rise. Hate and terrorism have infiltrated our borders like never before, while America's rights are being challenged and denied by a new worldwide order. Across the U.S., dozens of terrorist compounds operated by a group called Muslims of America are training followers in guerrilla warfare, hijacking cars, kidnapping, explosives, and weapons training, as seen in this group's captured home video footage. Hate crimes on the website Filthy Jewish Terrorists declare a genocide should be perpetuated against the Jewish populations of North America and Europe. Holocaust deniers spread their influence. The Holocaust was a deliberate Jewish conspiracy to advance the interests of Jews. 
the Department of Homeland Security has listed every synagogue and every Jewish school as a primary target for Islamic jihadists and Aryan nation extremists. Can Jewish Americans stand idly by their brother's blood, even as primary targets? Americans still have the individual right to keep and bear arms to secure a free state. But the future is uncertain. Those rights are under attack. Those rights are being challenged by local and national politicians, by advocacy groups, the media, the United Nations, and anti-freedom extremists. Those rights are being tested by unelected federal judges, by state courts, and by naive politicians who wrongly believe less guns means less violence, and the belief that authorities can best protect the public. Jews and all good people need to be taking action to stop the kinds of tyranny that we see in the world. Whether it's the tyranny of terrorist attacks or it's the tyranny of rule of government, either way we should be taking action to stop it and prevent it. It's time to act. The choice is clear. That's the choice you have. The choice is to live by God's law or die by manslaughter.